9 a.m. Eastern on C-SPAN. From the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about the history and future of NASA and the U.S. space program. He argues that the exploration of space benefits Americans more than they may think. This is just over two hours. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for your patience. My name is Suzanne Morris, and I am the Senior Manager of Public Programs here at the museum, and we are thrilled to have you all here tonight. So give yourselves a round of applause. The American Museum of Natural History has been home to some of the country's greatest thinkers, scientists and citizens who have changed the way we understand scientific and natural phenomenon and have brought that understanding to the national consciousness. From Theodore Roosevelt, who generated seminal American conservation and preservation practices, to Margaret Mead, who changed the way we view and value other cultures. Neil deGrasse Tyson brings his unique intellect and force of personality to help us understand the beauty and the importance of space science and exploration. The Frederick P. Rose Director of the Hayden Planetarium, born and raised in New York City, Dr. Tyson attended the Bronx High School of Science and later earned his BA in physics from Harvard, and then his PhD in astrophysics from Columbia. That's right. <laughs> He has been an advisor to NASA and to three presidents on matters related to space exploration, and has been awarded 16 honorary doctorates. He even has an asteroid named after him. Widely known as a frenemy of Pluto, he joins us tonight to discuss his latest book, Space Chronicles, Facing the Ultimate Frontier. Please join me now in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Thank you for that warm uh, introduction. Just so you know, uh, this is the only public talk anywhere that I'm giving on this book. So you are here, here and now, for it. Just so you know, I'm just saying. <laughs> You're not missing it somewhere else. Get ready up here. There we go. Let me tell you how it all began. There was the Big Bang, right? No, it's, uh, <laughs> just. <laughs> I was the 1990s. I was approached by Columbia University Press to write a chapter in an encyclopedia they were preparing to celebrate the end of the 20th century. And it was called, quite simply, The Columbia History of the 20th Century. And I might even have it here. This was it, okay? Now what's significant about it is the person originally scheduled to write that, I was approached in 1996. The, the person originally scheduled to write that was Carl Sagan. He had been asked to contribute a chapter on cosmic discovery to that volume. He had taken ill in 1995. He died in 1996. My name was put up as one who would then write in his stead. And I was honored to be asked although the size of the project was bigger than what I was really accustomed to. At the time, I was writing monthly columns for Natural History Magazine, coming in at two or 3,000 words. That's pretty much as what I could pump out in a month. Uh, this chapter was, uh, was asked of me to be 10,000 words. And I just, I, I, so I was almost declined. 
And then I said, no, I, maybe I can do something different, a little more creative. And I thought, okay, why not? Why not think of discovery? Not in the 20th century, not even in terms of the discovery of objects or places, but maybe the discovery of ideas. And I would track the transition from the discovery of places, going back to the era of the great explorers, to the discovery of ideas once you've mapped the whole earth, what is left there for you to discover. This is the bottom of the ocean, but philosophically, what's left for you once you know that the whole earth is there? You have the exploration of ideas, and those ideas then take you to new places beyond earth. They take you to space. And I thought to myself at the time, you know, I really want to go to Mars, like with people. That's, that's, an, that's an uncommon view among my colleagues, my astrophysics colleagues, by and large, maybe three to one ratio, see no value in sending humans into space. Now, that sentiment, by the way, is held by an entire generation of my colleagues who grew up in the 1960s wanting to become a scientist because of the manned program. And so there's a little bit of hypocrisy there, and I've taken them to task on it. Uh, not only that, it's, in my judgment, politically naive to think that NASA is simply your private science funding agency. More on that later. So I said to myself, well, how much would it cost to go to NASA? Let's say it cost, I mean, to go to Mars. Let's say it cost a half a billion, I mean, Sue, <laughs> We'd do that tomorrow if it cost a half a billion. Let's say it cost a half a trillion dollars. What's a factor of a thousand between friends here? <laughs> a half a trillion dollars, let's say. Or even a trillion. That's expensive. That's a lot of money. Actually, it's a small percent of our budget when spread out over many years, but nonetheless, it's a lot of money. And so for this chapter, what I said to myself is, I'm going to go back throughout the history of time and ask of the greatest projects ever undertaken by human beings, what did you do to compel your community to invest in this way? And I'd make a whole chapter, maybe even flesh it out to a book, of all the things that drove humans to do great things. And then I'd look at the mission to Mars and I'd line it up in the matrix and I'd say, okay, this is, Mars is this percent of our GDP. Who else spent that percent of their GDP and what did they do about it? I thought I'd fill a whole book. And in my analysis, contained in this chapter, the one chapter in here, the chapter is called Paths to Discovery. Oh, by the way, don't tell Columbia Press this, but you don't have to buy this book because that chapter was excerpted for the Space Chronicles book, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I brought this just for historical continuity so you know what's behind all of this, how it all began. So I made a list of the most expensive things we've ever done as a species. We could agree with most of what appears on this list. There's the Great Wall of China, expensive in terms of human or financial capital. The Great Wall of China, the Manhattan Project, the Apollo Project, the cathedral building as an enterprise in, during the Renaissance, the, oh, what else might we put there? How about the Columbus voyages, very expensive uh, uh, to Queen Isabella and uh, King Ferdinand, the, the Magellan voyages, just the whole episode of those voyages, the, uh, the pyramids, let's make our list. Any, any gripe about that list that I've just tossed up there? Sure, we'd all agree. Major investments in human and financial capital. Then I asked, what was the motivation for those? And in my list of the most expensive things we've ever done, I came up with only three drivers. Three, no more than three, no fewer than three. The number one driver of them all is war, or you can call it defense. That gets you the Great Wall of China. That gets you the Manhattan Project. In fact, that also gets you the Apollo Project. It's the I don't want to die driver, okay? <laughs> if you feel threatened and you're at risk, you will spend money without limit to not die. 
Okay, that's kind of an obvious one in retrospect. What's next? The prospect of gaining great economic wealth. Not quite as potent as the I don't want to die driver, but it is really powerful operating on the motivations of nations. That's what gets you the Columbus voyages. Columbus himself was a discoverer, but somebody had to write the check. And the people who wrote the check said, oh, by the way, Chris, while you're going, take these Spanish flags with you and put them wherever you land, declare their land for Spain, see if there are any riches there. You know, the Queen Isabella didn't say to Columbus, oh, tell us what new things you learned about the botany of where you land. <laughs> no, no, he might be interested in it. His crew might be interested in it, but not the people who wrote the checks. Third greatest driver. We see much less of this today than what was common hundreds of years ago. And that is the praise of royalty or deity. This is the effort to appease an entity that is either perceived to be or, is more, or, or literally is more powerful than you are. So that's how you get the pyramids. That's how you get, um, you get the, the cathedral building. The, now, so today you don't have kings and gods motivating major funded projects of nations. But there was a day when we did. Okay. So I said to myself, if we are going to go to Mars, and Mars is expensive, it's going to have to satisfy one of those two criteria. Otherwise, we're just never going to Mars. And this was my revelation. And that is the centerpiece of that chapter. And all the rest of what went on in human culture orbits that revelation in that chapter. And I said to myself, my God, I wonder how many people know this. Because I, you hang around space enthusiasts, and what do they tell you? They'll say, oh, the reason why we stopped going to the moon, we didn't have leaders. We needed visionary people. We stopped being risk takers. There's a whole list of arguments people will give you for why we are not in space, right? Why we are not, why the space frontier has not continued beyond humans landing on the moon. There's a whole list. I deduced that every, without exception, every item on this list was delusional. <laughs> it doesn't it include other things. Oh, we need to explore space for science because it's in our DNA, because, it is, because we're Americans and Americans are explorers. All these reasons are given. My read of history tells me that none of those reasons matter to those who are writing the checks. That's the difference. And so I thought, well, I got to tell people this. Because if we're going to go to Mars, then we have to motivate people in a way that's either militaristically driven, but nobody really wants that to be the reason, or economically driven. And so I started exploring in what ways our presence in space can satisfy one or the other or both of those criteria. I was even invited after that article was published, that chapter was published, to a space development conference in Washington. I was uh, positioned between Buzz Aldrin and the fellow, forgive me, I forgot his name, who wrote uh, October Sky. Anybody remember the fellow's name? Homer, yes, Homer Hick -Hick Hickam, thank you, Homer Hickam. So these are, these are like rah-rah folks, okay? One of them has actually been on the moon, another one was inspired, so, so there's a lot of inspiration talk in front of me and behind me. But that's not what I talked about. I said, any ambitions in space, if you expect them to be driven just by the will to wanna go, or by the longing for a charismatic leader, you are deluded. That was, I, I was blunt, said it right to Buzz Aldrin's face. <laughs> kind, I mean, I was a little more polite about it at the time, but I just said, you know, I think you might be a little misdirected in your thinking. That's the polite way to say you are clueless about what's actually driving 
human motivation here. And so, okay. A couple of years would go by, I'd get a phone call. It's the White House. This is April 2001. It's the White House. It's the George W. Bush White House. I get a phone call. They say, hello, is this Neil deGrasse Tyson? I said, yes. They said, oh, we want to check your interest to see if you would serve on a presidential commission. I said, a commission on what? I don't even know what a commission is. What, what, first of all, right, I'm an academic. I don't hang out in Washington. I don't know anything about Washington. In academia, politics is the barrier between where you're standing and where you want to go. Whereas in Washington, politics is the currency of all interactions. So this is not my culture. They want me to come to Washington to serve on a commission. I said, well, what's the title of the commission? the Commission on the Future of the United States Aerospace Industry. And I said, you got the right Tyson? I, I don't, you know, I, I fly in airplanes. I don't fly airplanes. What, and no, we know who you are. We, we've read your writings. We, and I said, could they have read what, how, how? And I said, well, who else? He, so they read me the list of other people there. Buzz Aldrin was <laughs> going to be on that, on that commission. And just in case you don't remember, Buzz Aldrin was Apollo 11 astronaut, the second person to walk on the moon of the first mission to the lunar surface. So, all right, there are 12 commissioners appointed to this. All right, now I'm from New York City born and raised. Now in New York, you can go all day without ever even seeing a Republican, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> am, I, am I lying? I'm, I'm not, right? This is, I'm not, uh, <laughs> so wait, there goes one, he's in the corner, in the back, I think. So I'm getting called by a Republican president and I'm an academic, and I later would lear I'd learn that George Bush at Yale did not do well in his astronomy class, you know. So, and they were still counting dimple chads in Florida. And so, and they said, well, we have to just ask you a few questions. And out came a series of questions, all the questions that are like illegal on a job application, I got asked. Well, because, because it's, not a, it's an appointment, it's not a job, right? So the rules don't apply. What's your sexual preference? What's your religion? Have you ever protested? Have you ever been arrested for anything? Have you ever protested and almost got arrested? You know, it was, it was this whole long series of questions. Then, then, towards the, so I answer the questions, fine. And then it said, are, are you, familiar with the president's politics and policies. And I said, well, yes, but just from what I read in the paper, you know, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not a politician, but so yeah, I think I'm familiar. And then they said, what do you think of them? <laughs> so, um, so I said, how do I answer this? And what probably was only 10 seconds of thought felt like it was many minutes before I uttered my reply. At the time, uh, George Bush was appointing members of his cabinet, and some of them looked quite promising at the time. This is two th early 2001. Colin Powell was just announced as one of his chief advisors, and, and uh, Condoleezza Rice was like provost at, 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 in Stanford, right? So these are like educated people. He's appointing people smarter than he is. That, that, okay, there's some hope there, I thought to myself. So, so I said, because what I really wanted to do was reach through the phone, because when they said, what do you think of them? I wanted to reach through the phone and say, dimple chads and the And I said, but that would not be productive. They're trying to do, they're trying to do good here. <laughs> and so I gained my composure. And like I said, it was probably only 10 seconds, although it felt like minutes, I replied. I said, I applaud the president's efforts to surround himself with talented people 
so that he can make the best decisions he can in the interest of this nation. <laughs> that was a Thursday. By Monday, I was appointed to a presidential commission to study the future of the United States aerospace industry. I would learn that I was the lone academic on this commission. I would learn that coming from my left of liberal postures, having been born and raised in New York, coming from a liberal family, I would learn that in order to have a conversation with those who are not, you cannot stand there and have that conversation. It doesn't work because there's actually a smoke screen there and way on the far right, there's a smoke screen too. You can't have that conversation. This is what the television news uh, talk shows do. They get people with hot air on both ends and at the end there's just more hot air. You actually have to crawl out of those zones and stand in the middle and then have that conversation. And over the period of that commission, that's what I did. And upon doing so, I would learn things about the far right I would not, have not have, would not have known or even seen or understood. And so, in fact, it was quite illuminating for me to have this experience. I'll give you an example of a liberal smokescreen bias because there are biases on each extreme and it's hard to see them when you're there. You have to step out and look back. Here's a, here's a bleeding liberal, a bleeding heart liberal bias. You ready? Because n nobody in New York liked Bush, right? So I said, well, I was appointed to a Bush commission. They said, oh, they appointed you because you're black. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, there's another black person on the commission. A four-star Air Force general. So the argument evaporates immediately. There, there is no argument. Okay. There were, th there were two women on the panel. One of them an aerospace analyst for Wall Street. Another a former member of Congress who had Air Force bases in her district in Florida. Other people there, there's the, the, the head of aerospace at Lockheed Martin. There was, of course, Buzz Aldrin who's been on the moon. You know, as we go around introducing ourselves, I guess it's tough to follow Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> well, I've been on the moon. Okay, we're done. What, what, I got nothing to... <laughs> I can't, I got nothing on that, okay? <laughs> you know, um, what was in that meeting, what I noticed that everybody there reeked of testosterone because they were captains of industry, heads of agency, former, you know, security advisors. Even the women had testosterone. Like I said, the, 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 secu the securities analyst for Wall Street Anything she would say or write about your company would affect your stock price. You know, they treated her kindly. <laughs> now, why, did I, why am I even taking you down this road? I'm just trying to share with you my baptism into this world of aerospace and NASA and what I've done about it since then. All right, that commission was formed because... Oh, back up one moment. 12 members of the commission. It's a White House commission, but the rules are six members are appointed by Congress. Six members are appointed by the White House. Of the six members appointed by Congress, what was it? The, there was a mix that reflected the, the partisan split in Congress at the time. Okay, so this is a, they're trying to be politically fair as they construct this, but since it's a White House commission, the White House appoints six people. Bush could have appointed six Republicans, but he didn't. I am not a Republican. That was one of the questions they asked me. What is your political affiliation? You know they're going to ask me that if they're going to ask me what religion I am and what's my sexual preference. So, so I said I'm a registered Democrat. So that was known to them. I was nonetheless hired. So the talk that, oh, Bush, they'd never hire. No, this is just false. It's part of the smokescreen that exists at the limits of each of the political spectrum. So, so I'm there, and apparently in the previous 15 years, the aerospace industry had lost a half a million jobs. 
There had been huge consolidation from dozens and dozens of companies down to just four or five. That's why these aerospace companies have joint names, Lockheed Martin. All right, where'd that come from? It used to be Martin Marionetta, and it used to be just Lockheed. All right, these companies started collapsing down into just a few. Congress was worried what effect this would have on the aerospace industry of the nation. Because aerospace is responsible for our military uh, airborne security, it's responsible for our transportation, for commerce, they recognized it was a fundamental part of what it is to live in America in the 21st century. And they wanted to get to the bottom of it. And many of the, many of the aerospace companies, they not only make the airplanes, they make the spaceships. And so we had aero people on the commission and space people on the commission. I was counted as one of the space people. One of the uh, trips we took was around the world. This is, 2000, late, uh, this is 2002 around the world to key places that have burgeoning aerospace industries to find out, is there some com competition that we're not living up to? What are they doing that we're not? We visited China. I went to Beijing in 2002, my first time there. I went there with the complete portfolio of stereotypes about what I would expect. Boulevards of bicycles, right? This is what I expected. That's what was on the film loops that I saw growing up. We arrive in Beijing, yeah, there, there are bicycles, but that's not what's filling the boulevards. There's Mercedes and Volkswagens and, and BMWs, and, and it's not any, like any picture I had seen. We, go, we meet with ca captains of industry there, heads of agency there, and I look carefully and I see on their hand college rings, graduate degrees, from American universities in engineering. Almost every one of the leaders of, that were shaping the future culture, the, the, future, the future industrial culture of, of, of China, were trained and educated here in America in engineering schools. We took an excursion to the Great Wall of China. I'd never been there, all right? I'm on the Great Wall, the wall just goes, you, you, and then it disappears in the mist, right? You, can, you can't see the end of it. It's, there it is. I look in every direction, there's only bricks that made the, Chinese, the wall, okay? Oh, by the way, do you know what defined the distance between the turrets? There's a set, there's a reason for the distance that was set between where the turrets are. That's exactly right. It had, to do with, it had to do with the precision with which an archer can kill you at a distance. So the turrets are twice that distance. So anyone climbing over, they can take you out. It's a military project, as we've already agreed. So, oh, not only that, the stairs within the turrets turn in a particular way so that if you're right-handed, the side where you're carrying the bow doesn't rub into someone coming up the stairs the other direction. Military thinking at the time. Anyhow, that has nothing to do with, that's just an aside. So I, I'm on the Great, Great Wall of China, and I, I don't see any technology anywhere. This is out in the middle of the boonies. Oh, by the way, there were like Chinese peasants that had come in from I mean, I'm guessing they were peasants because they were very sun-darkened and were not very well-dressed, but this is nonetheless a tourist trip for them. None of them were looking at the wall. They all wanted to photograph themselves next to me. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I was more interesting than the wall. Uh, the only black person they've ever seen in their lives. <laughs> so I said, I'm gonna just try something. I went to a friend of mine, I said, can I, can I borrow your cell phone for a minute? They had a GSM-enabled cell phone. I called my parents in Westchester, New York. Dialed the number. My mother answers. I said, Mom? She said, oh, are you home so soon? That's how good that connection was. <laughs> I, I'm on the great 
wall of China. There's no antennas anywhere. I don't see any electricity. I don't see anything. And I'm having a conversation with my mother, and she thinks I am back home. There was nobody in China saying, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> Something was underfoot in China. Something was going on there that we were in denial of. Visited Russia, Star City. The head of Star City. We're there. We had Buzz Aldrin with us. There's a book in their offices signed by, by folks who have been to orbit. And so it was a nice ritual ceremony where Buzz Aldrin comes out and signs the book. There's a statue of Yuri Gagarin, standing bold right out front. Uh, it was 10.30 in the morning, I think, and the head of the center, we were all crowded into his office, and he's got this cabinet behind him, and he says, oh, it's 10.30, he opens up the cabinet and says, time for vodka. <laughs> so, it was like, okay, that's how you, you know, you got to go with, with the flow. So I'm having the vodka, and I'm like, the vodka, and I'm getting kicked under the table. It's like, no, you don't, your pinky doesn't stick out when you're <laughs> downing vodka in Russia, okay? Here's my point about that. <laughs> Many more points to come. Plus, I want to make sure we have time for Q&A. We visited France, England, with whom we have, we are told, a common language. <laughs> uh, we visited all these countries. But here's Russia. I don't even know the alphabet. I recognize a couple of them. Some of them look like the letter pi. That's about it, the Cyrillic alphabet. But when we started talking about space, there was a bond there that I did not share with any other community around the world. Even though we were sworn enemies during the Cold War, we alone embarked on that grandest of adventures to explore space. There was a camaraderie, a kinship, even though we did not speak the same language, but I felt it and it was deep. It was in the culture. It was in the timbre of our interaction. I'll never forget the feeling that I had being in their presence. And in the gift shop where all these trinkets that are inspired by space achievements. One of my most cherished possessions in my office, it might be in one of the YouTube tours of my office if you stumble on it, is a set of Petrushka dolls. Did I pronounce that right? Petrushka dolls. Normally, what do you find on them? There's some sequence of heads of state, usually, or some, or people you don't recognize, all right? This set of dolls had Russian spacecraft, the biggest of which the International Space Station, they're our partners. And the littlest of which was what? Sputnik, of course. It's the cutest set of dolls you ever want to see, so cute. <laughs> Somebody said, I'm tired of looking at Gorbachev's face on my Petrushka dolls. Give me technology. Give me the frontier of space. In Brussels, we meet a coordinated set of the European Union's representatives because they're getting together to explore space together and to embark on space adventures together. One of the issues was we were perfecting our GPS. Yes, it was a military funded project, but once it became part of, of our, our commerce, then it, the ownership in a way kind of shifted from the military to the public. All right, our planes are equipped with GPS, GPS, um, receivers so that they can find their way around the world. Europe was planning a competing system to the GPS system. It's called Galileo. It's extremely expensive to do this. We're there and we're, and remember this is the Aerospace Commission. We said, well, you can use our GPS. What, what's the matter? Oh, we want to build our own. Our worry was that if they build it, then they will require every one of our airplanes to be equipped with their with their Galileo receivers, upping the cost of equipping all of our airplanes, which was already in a bad economic state. 
So we're at the table. And I remember the guy sitting across from me. He was kind of smug because we were saying, we want you to use this, and they were just doing this on their own. It was as we were almost begging, actually, because we had economic issues that we had to protect. And this guy, he was just kind of smug there. And I think his chair might have been a little higher than mine. You know, you know how that, sometimes people do that, you know? And I had an epiphany that moment. I said to myself, I am angry. I am pissed off. Not because this guy was smug, but because here is an industry, here is, a, here is an enterprise that we and the Russians pioneered, and we're sitting at a table bargaining as though it's soybeans, as though it's some kind of trade regulation that we have to resolve. And I said, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't have experience in this state of mind as an American. Certainly not with regard to technology. I grew up, we grew up at a time when America led the world in technology. And when you lead the world, you never find yourself at a bargaining table begging for somebody to, no, you're so far ahead of the world, they don't even know how to sit at the same table with you. That's the America I grew up in. And for me to bear witness to this exchange, I was angry with America because we had lost our way. We were coasting on the investments of a previous generation. Coasting. And when you coast, you eventually slow down and stop. You can coast for a while and you, 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 you think everything is going well because there's still the time delay between innovations at one epoch and when they reveal themselves economically in another. I was angry. Meanwhile, I come back to America and I try to share some of these ideas with people and everyone is talking about the Saturn V. Now, I love me some Saturn V, don't get me wrong. I even have a Saturn V tie, which I did not wear today. I wore a different tie today. That's okay, six of you like my tie, that's fine. I have about a hundred ties, and this is just one of them. Uh, anytime people talked about space, they kept referencing the golden era of space. I don't have a problem with that, except another revelatory observation came upon me. I don't, have you ever seen the Saturn V up close? There's like four of them. Uh, one is standing vertically at Huntsville, Alabama, where the Saturn V was invented. And actually, they have two. How greedy of them. One of them is standing vertically, and it's a model. Another one is in captivity in, an, in a museum space where each segment was is an actual rocket part. So, uh, segments that would have been flown had we continued making the Saturn V beyond Apollo 17. And so you have the rocket with pieces separated so you can stand between them and observe them. All right, so there's two in Huntsville, there's one in Florida, there's one in, in Houston. So I think that's a total of four. Four, if someone in the audience agrees. So, so you go visit these Saturn V rockets and you just can't believe it. You look at one of the engine nozzles out of the five at the base, an engine nozzle big enough to have a tea party for five in a single nozzle. And you walk the length of it, it's 32 stories long, 32 stories tall. Then you see the tiny little capsule at the top where the three astronauts were. This is the famous rocket equation manifest large. The rocket equation tells you that for every sort of little bit of payload you want to put up, you need that much more fuel to launch the fuel that you haven't burned yet. Okay? So, this rapidly runs away from you and your spaceships have to get exponentially large depending on the size of your payroll, payload. So that's why the Saturn V rocket is 31 stories of fuel, 
four stories of astronaut and, and a, 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 a lunar lander. So here we are genuflecting in front of this piece of hardware, saying, damn, look at how we did it back then, my gosh. Revelation number four. Why am I genuflecting in front of the Saturn V rocket? It's the first rocket ever to leave low Earth orbit and go someplace. And we did it how many times? Eight times. Is that right? Do I have the count right? Apollo 8, Apollo 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. What's that? But thank you. Apollo 10. So we did it nine times. Apollo 10 went to the moon, descended towards the lunar surface, and then backed out. Now, if you, if you were that astronaut, that you, <laughs> I, I would have said, Houston, I can't hear you. Uh, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> uh, no, you're breaking up. Okay, we we got to land. <laughs> so. So, so where was I before I interrupted myself? <laughs> we were, we're, thank you, we're genuflecting in front of the Saturn V, the first spaceship to take people out of low Earth orbit and go somewhere. And I said, well, is there any piece of technology that you can name where you are genuflecting in front of the first version of it, wondering how they did it? The first cell phone. <laughs> Are you saying, wow, look at that. I wonder how they did that. <laughs> the first television, it's a little circle this big. The first computer was half the size of this room. You say, yeah, put it in a museum, but I don't want to do that. Every form of technology there ever was, as the decades move on, the first version of it looks more and more quaint until you dust it off, put it in a corner of museum, and you forget about it. Yet we're still cherishing the Saturn V rocket, a rocket that's 40 years old, 45 years old. So I knew something else was wrong with America. If you keep praising the first of something, it meant nothing came after it. More evidence that we stopped dreaming we stopped exploring. So what happens? The Apollo era ends, 1972, Apollo 17, the last of the Apollo missions to the moon. Oh, by the way, if, if science really mattered to NASA, I mean, how many scientists would have gone? We would have put a scientist on every mission, wouldn't we have? But we didn't. One scientist went to the moon, Harrison Schmidt, Jack Schmidt. And that was the last mission to the moon. Let's not kid ourselves. Kennedy's speech, May 25th, 1961, six weeks after Yuri Gagarin had gone into orbit and come back safely, we didn't yet have a vehicle that wouldn't kill one of our astronauts going into orbit. John F. Kennedy stands up in his second State of the Union address of that year, May 25th, 1961, and utters these prophetic words, we will put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. We collectively have cleansed our memory of that era and of that speech. And in the cleansing, we think of Kennedy as a visionary, as a charismatic leader who dreams of space like the rest of us. And there's some of that rhetoric around that part of the speech. He talks about exploring space and the value of that to mankind. Back then it was okay to say mankind, right? It was 1961. <laughs> so go two paragraphs earlier in that same speech. What does he say there? How about that? I'll tell you what he's, but by the way, in Florida, Kennedy Space Center, there's a bust of him right in the front entrance. And there's a whole granite wall behind him and they have the excerpt of the speech where he says, we'll put a man on the moon, bring him safely back to Earth. It's right there. Okay. Two paragraphs earlier. If the events of recent weeks, he's indirectly referencing Yuri Gagarin. 
if the events of recent weeks are any indication of the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere, then we must show the world the path of freedom over the path of tyranny. It was a battle cry against communism. That's the war driver that led to the check writing that created the NASA centers and garnered the fraction of the federal budget that getting to the moon required. Why isn't that part of his speech on the granite wall at Kennedy Space Center? Plenty of room there, I checked. <laughs> you could even summarize and say, kill the commies, go to the moon, okay? It would fit just fine. That's part of the delusional thinking that goes on. So when we stopped going to the moon, upon learning, essentially, that Russia has, is not getting to the moon. Russia is not going to get there. They stopped their moon program. By the way, Russia beat us in practically every space achievement until then. First satellite, first living thing in orbit, first human in orbit, first woman in orbit, first black person in orbit, a Cuban uh, remember, Cuba was friends with the Soviet Union. Um, first, uh, first space docking, first space station. Just go down the list. In fact, how else do we remember ourselves back then? As space pioneers? No. Practically every decision we made regarding space was in reaction to something the Soviet Union did, or in reaction to something they said they were going to do. We didn't lead any of those achievements. We trailed them. Another delusional point from that era. So now we stop going to the moon. The space enthusiasts say, oh, we just need another leader here and now to, to continue this because Mars is in reach. Let's keep going to Mars. No, there's no reason to go to Mars because Russia's not going to Mars. <laughs> so the whole program ends. It just ends. And people are looking for things to blame other than the fact that the Soviet Union did not commit to the moon. It's that simple. Really, I promise. Let's go forward a little further. 1989, July 20th, the steps of the Air and Space Museum, Washington, D.C. George Herbert Walker Bush, President of the United States, uses this auspicious moment to stand on the steps of that auspicious, of, of that, um, um, uh, one of the greatest museums on Earth, the Museum of, of the National Air and Space Museum, on the 20th anniversary of the Apollo landing. He says, we will build a, a space station and a colony on the moon and go on to Mars. He wanted to give like a Kennedy speech. Well, in his speech, was there a war driver? No. He just, he just took, the, he just took the, 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 the glowing rhetoric part. He, he referenced Columbus and that discovery is in our genes as humans and as Americans. He went down that path that delusional path, he went down. And so he says, let's do this. It'll take 30 years, but let's do this. So then some folks at Johnson Space Center costed out this plan, half a trillion dollars. It was DOA in Congress, half a trillion dollars. So we didn't do it. Then there are people saying, well, he didn't have the charisma of Kennedy. He certainly had an auspicious occasion. He didn't have the charisma, they say. It's got nothing to do with charisma. What happened in 1989? Peace broke out in Europe. That's what happened in 1989? You want to do a half a trillion dollar project and you're not even at war? Who are you kidding? What he was missing was not Kennedy's charisma, which that, that may be true, but that's not <laughs> what interfered with anybody following his plan. Not only that, 
NASA's budget in, in constant dollars, so you can compare this accurately, was, I don't know, $17 billion a year? Multiply that by 30 years, you've got a half a trillion dollars. The half a trillion was already in the flow of money into NASA. So to say it costs half a trillion, we can't afford it, that's a lie. That's how much money you're going to give NASA in 30 years anyway. So there's all this delusional thinking going on out there. The original title of this book, submitted to the publisher, was Failure to Launch, <laughs> The Dreams and Delusions of Space Enthusiasts. And they said, no, 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 that's too depressing. We can't have that title. We can't, we can't have the word failure in the title because that would just be bad. <laughs> Let me try to wrap up here just because I'm just ranting now. If I keep at this, I'll just be, I'll be bleeding from my eyes. And, all right. So <laughs> don't get me started. So all right. In the decade of the 60s, that was arguably the most turbulent decade in American history since the Civil War, 100 years earlier. There was a Cold War. There was a hot war. We were losing 100 servicemen a week. We, in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, of course, there were assassinations. The Civil Rights Movement was unfolding weekly on the evening news campus unrest, protests, students, uh, people getting arrested. The one shining beacon of that decade was the Apollo program. The end of 1968, Apollo 8, the first mission to leave low Earth orbit, they did a figure eight loop around the moon. Coming around the backside of the moon, one of the astronauts picked up his Hasselblad camera, saw the beautiful lunar landscape, pulled it up to take a photo, and there rose Earth. Earth, as never before seen by human eyes. That picture called Earthrise is one of the most recognized pictures there ever was. Earthrise. I have a gripe with the title because, of course, um, relative to Earth, the moon doesn't rotate. It always shows a face towards us, which means Earth is always in the sky from the near side of the moon. So Earth doesn't rise on the moon. It's either never there or it's always there. All right? So it le leaves people to think that Earth rises on the moon the way the moon rises on Earth. It rose on the moon because they're, they're moving around the moon. That's why all right, when you do that, stuff comes up that doesn't, have, that doesn't belong, that, not supposed to come up, all right? What else happened in the 1960s? People dreamed about tomorrow. You didn't have to go long. The folks old enough in here to remember. You go a week at most, there'd be an article in Life magazine, Look magazine. Time magazine, talking about the city of tomorrow, the home of tomorrow, transportation of tomorrow. No, we never got the flying cars. Okay, I'm still angry about that. But nonetheless, we were dreaming. We were imagining a tomorrow. And who would enable that tomorrow? But scientists and technologists and engineers. They are the enablers of tomorrow's dreams. That was understood in that decade. We actually had an innovation decade. What do you think the World's Fair was all about? Right here in Flushing Meadow. It was about tomorrow. 1964. We're on our way to the moon in 1964. The Gemini program is testing pieces of the moon voyage. One by one, each next mission more ambitious than the next. 1964 is all about tomorrow. The Unisphere, that's not just a globe of the Earth, it has three rings around it. Where do you think they got that idea? John Glenn's three orbits around the Earth. 
Space was inspiring a nation to dream about tomorrow. It was inspiring innovation. Steve Jobs and Bill Gates were age 14 and 13. I mean, I got it written here. Let me. 13 and 14 when we landed on the moon. I submit to you that in spite of the moon voyage being driven with military motives, that the return on that investment is huge economically. And I'm not talking about Spin-offs? I could, but I'm not. I love spin-offs. Who, 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 we love spin-offs, okay? There's some great spin-offs from NASA. Among them is the capacity to perform LASIK surgery accurately and inexpensively. LASIK surgery predates NASA, but it was expensive and it didn't always work, all right? The algorithms and the, and the laser guidance that enabled the space shuttle to dock with the space station accurately, without bumping in and having to try it four times, that got ported to LASIK surgery. How many people here have had LASIK surgery? Yeah. What, one person in the whole place has LASIK surgery? <laughs> and she's not wearing glasses. And, and, you know, of course, Tang predates NASA, but it became a beverage of choice <laughs> for them. To this day, I know not why. The point is, you know, and, and if, you're in, if you're into spin-offs, every year, every couple of years, NASA comes out with a spin-off book. Each product that was patented because of space motivation that became a product is described here in every one of these volumes. I, this is 2009. I think there's been some since then. It's beautifully composed and written. Uh, some interesting ones, there's an uh, intracochlear device that enables deaf people to hear. Even low-tech solutions like groove pavement. You ever see turns on highways that have grooves? NASA figured out that that's a good thing to do. Now you might say, well, why didn't anybody else think about it? They were not motivated to do so. If someone says, I don't want the shuttle skipping down the runway, <laughs> the shuttle does not have propulsion on the runway as it lands. It's a, it's a glider. And so you, you want that stuff to stay straight and not slide off. People thinking about this because they care about the shuttle that went into space more than they care about your car. <laughs> That's an important fact here. <laughs> so yes, there are spin-offs and they go on and on. And in the book, there, I have a paragraph carefully composed where I talk about sneaking into your room at night and removing everything from your home that, that, that was inspired either directly or indirectly by space technologies. And you would wake up a technological pauper in, in, in a deep state of poverty, technological poverty, with bad eyesight to boot. <laughs> and, and you'll go out and get rained upon because you would not have gotten an accurate weather forecast. I claim that this is not even the best reason to do it. And dare I say, science has never caused any governments to spend huge sums of money. There's a radar level below which we'll pay for science. Hubble telescope sort of kissed that boundary. You, we can do that. But above that, and depending on the wealth of the nation, determines how much science they'll agree to do. Above that level, it takes multiple years to fund it, and the check writing agencies, the check writing uh, um, um, uh, political entities, the interest to do it has to survive changes in political leadership and fluctuations in the economy. That's why if I say, let's go to Mars so we can do science, if there's a downturn in the economy, the press goes to the unemployment line and the person says, I can't feed my family, and my house has been foreclosed, and the reporter says, but we're going to Mars. It doesn't play well. That's why only two drivers work. The I don't want to die driver and the I don't want to die poor driver, okay? <laughs> I claim that in the 1960s, not only did NASA innovate, because you have to innovate when you advance a frontier, we created for ourselves an innovation culture. 
Steve Jobs and Bill Gates did not end up working for NASA. They ended up innovating, though. Okay? It's a culture of innovation. You are inventing tomorrow. I now claim, I'm almost done here. Sorry. I now claim that NASA is an engine of motivation such as the world has never seen. Not only do you benefit from the innovations of advancing a space frontier, if you advance a space frontier in a big way, writ large across the headlines, we're going to Mars, we're going to the backside of the moon, we're going to stop that asteroid. By the way, there might be geopolitical reasons to go into space. I'm not going to debate that. There could be future touristic reasons, scientific reasons. There could be exploitive reasons for going into space, like you want to mine the moon. I assert that if you create a healthy space, space platform where you strap rockets as whatever you need for the task at hand, you don't make a destination-driven space program. No. I'm not going to say, let's just go to Mars. Because then you get to Mars, and then, then what, right? Let's, if you're laying out the interstate system in the United States, you don't say, let's only go to LA, you know? That's not how you do it. You put roads everywhere, and people choose where they want to go and when they want to go for whatever reasons they come up with. So for me, a healthy space program is one that can choose to go anywhere. There could be military reasons, economic reasons, whatever are the reasons that confront us. All right, so now. When you innovate, and it's writ large, you have grand epic adventures that echo through the educational pipeline. How might it do it? I stand up in front of an eighth grade class and I say, who wants to be an aerospace engineer? So that you can design a plane that's 10% more fuel efficient than the one your parents flew. That's one scenario. Who wants to be an aerospace engineer so that you can design an airplane that can navigate the rarefied atmosphere of Mars? I'm going to be getting the best students in the class. Not everybody cares about fuel efficiency. We want them to, but that's not how you get smart people to express their smarts. We Tell ourselves we live in a free country. If a smart person is interested in whatever they're interested in, they ought to be able to do that. Because when they do, everybody benefits. There's all this talk. Why, why get advances this roundabout way? Let's put money directly where the problem is. No, it doesn't work that way. Walk into a hospital with a ledger. Make a list of every machine in that hospital with an on-off switch. Every machine that is brought into the service of diagnosing the condition of your body without cutting you open. You will learn that every one of those machines is based on a principle of physics discovered by a physicist who had no interest in medicine. Right on back to x-rays themselves. Wilhelm Röntgen, the very first Nobel Prize in Physics went to him. That Nobel Prize was not in physiology, it was in physics. Its physiological applications were manifest immediately, of course. I see my bones on the photographic plate. Take it over to the hospital. <laughs> go, go for it. I'm going to get the next thing going here in my lab, right? So you need medical technologists to create these machines, the cross-pollination of disciplines. The entire radiology department of a, of, a, of a hospital is based on nuclear physics. The magnetic resonance imager, probably the most useful machine in the hospital today, is based on a principle called nuclear magnetic resonance. It's got the other N word, nuclear. So um, they remove it from the hospital device because it spooks people. Here, get into this nuclear machine. I'm not getting it. Okay, get into this. 
Magnetic resonance imager. Oh, I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> That's based on a principle discovered by a physicist who happened to be my college physics professor. He was in basically he was doing astrophysics, concerning himself with the behavior of atomic nuclei in the interstellar medium, interstellar space. So you want to fund all the frontiers of science. Now, how are you going to motivate that? All I'm saying is that when you go into space, everybody knows about it. If you just fund the National Science Foundation, those same kids in the eighth grade class, have, have, you ever, have anyone ever stood up and said, when I grow up, I want to be an NSF researcher? I, I, I've never seen that. I'm sorry. But they've heard of NASA. So has the rest of the world. So I see a healthy NASA. I say double its budget. Double it. Double it. Right now, it's a half a penny on your tax dollar. Did you know that? 100% of everyone who tells me, why are we spending money up there and not down here? We're spending too much up there. 100% of them did not know that NASA's budget is one half of 1% of their tax dollar. And I've, I've measured this out. You can take a dollar bill and cut horizontally one half of 1% of that width. It doesn't even get you into the ink. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, double it. Then we could go to Mars in a big way. Yes, we can check that asteroid that has us in our sights. We can go back to the moon. And yes, put a colony on the moon. Just because Gingrich is Republican doesn't mean he doesn't have an okay idea about this. <laughs> what might be the motivation to put it? It could be economic, whatever is the reason. If you're advancing a frontier, you innovate, and when you innovate, you invent things that drive tomorrow's economies. Because right now, America is sliding backwards. The rest of the world is passing us by. We're practically in a, we are in a recession. Jobs are going overseas. There's not enough scientists in the pipeline. Everybody wants to put a Band-Aid on each problem. Jobs going overseas? Let's change the tariffs and give tax incentives so the companies will want to keep their jobs here. Oh, uh, we need better sci more scientists? Let's make better science teachers. And let's do, okay, we got that, okay. And here are all these Band-Aids going around. If you double NASA's budget and we go into space in a big way and it's writ large across the newspapers, we resurrect the innovation culture that prevailed 40 years ago. Nobody today is thinking about tomorrow. Nobody's thinking about a world's fair. I, I, I don't remember the last time I saw an article dreaming about the city of tomorrow. They all ended. You know when they ended? After we stopped going to the moon. So I submit that a healthy NASA is a healthy America. And the two, as, as NASA's future goes, so too does that of America. And if NASA's healthy, then you don't need a program to convince people that science and engineering is good to do because they'll see it writ large on the paper. There'll be calls for engineers to help us go ice fishing on Europa where there's an ocean of water that's been liquid for billions of years. We're gonna dig through the soils of Mars and look for life. That'll get me the best biologists. Look at the NASA portfolio today. It's got biology, chemistry, physics, geology, it'd be planetary geology, aerospace engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, all the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math represented in the NASA portfolio. A healthy NASA pumps that. A healthy NASA is a flywheel that society taps for innovations. I don't know of another force of nature as powerful as NASA. And in this next generation, we go in because we need to stoke our economy. And that's one of the two big reasons any nation has ever done anything. And I'm not so naive as to say, let's do it for science. Science will piggyback it. We, we do, we've done that forever. Right, right on back to Charles Darwin. Did the Beagle go to the Galapagos Islands for Charles Darwin? No, he, he's hitched a ride. Did he pay for that voyage? No. 
I've always had other motivations. Science piggybacks this stuff pretty well, and I'm cool with that. <laughs> uh, one last thing before I end with... Uh, uh, where'd it go? So this book came out only like two weeks ago. All right. Oh, thank you, thank you. All right. So, because what I just told you touches on politics and on economics, what has happened is the interest in this book has crossed over and out of the circle of space enthusiasts and has gotten the interest of economists and politicians. To the point, I think, that, but, but I'm just, I'm, I'm just, in, I'm, I'm enchanted by this. I'm, I'm, I'm just, so, Foreign Affairs Magazine excerpted the first chapter of this for a cover story, The Case for Space. This lands in the lap of every single congressman in Washington. So within a week of this book being released and this article appearing, I get a phone call <laughs> I get a phone call that said, we want you to testify in front of the Senate. Now, generally, I don't like speaking directly to politicians. <laughs> no, I, I don't mean it in any insulting way. No. <laughs> no, what I mean, I mean by that is, I'm an educator, I'm a scientist, and it's my preference to speak to the electorate, to to highlight, to inform, to educate, to illuminate. And in that way, you choose the representatives that you can in the best interest of your communities. For me to go straight to a politician who is representing a million people or an entire state, I, I don't, I'm not comfortable doing that. So I testified. It's, it's, not, it's, it's now on YouTube. It's, it's, uh, my testimony is six minutes of testimony. And I said, that, you know, I don't know if anybody's listening, I don't know. It ended up on YouTube. And in the past week, it has 200,000 views. And so I realized, and, and some of the comments are very moving. People said they almost started crying. Because in there, I'm appealing to the earth, I'm appealing for all of us to dream about tomorrow again. And I don't know another force that will enable that, but the pathway that I just described. So I'd like to believe that there's, we're tapping something deep within us all that wants, to, wants tomorrow to come again and will certainly enjoy the economic benefits that come from it because it shifts our vision from worrying about where your jobs are to creating the jobs that issue forth from innovations, jobs that are high-level jobs that are so innovative they can't go overseas because they haven't figured out how to do it yet. That's the state of the country I want to enter. <laughs> I just like messing with the sound people on there. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Actually, can I have a little more volume there, please? Thank you. My, my, our sound, sound guy over there. Thank you. A little more? 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 More. Thank you. Uh, this is the only part of the book I'm going to read verbatim, and I'll end with this, if, with your permission. Uh, I wrote this in the spring of 2008. Dear NASA, Happy birthday. Perhaps you didn't know, but we're the same age. In the first week of October, 1958, you were born of the National Aeronautics and Space Act as a civilian space agency, while I was born of my mother in the East Bronx. <laughs> so the year-long celebration of our golden anniversaries which began the day after we both turned 49, provides me a unique occasion to reflect on our past, our present, and our future. 
I was three years old when John Glenn first orbited Earth. I was eight when you lost astronauts Chaffee, Grissom, and White in that tragic fire of their Apollo 1 capsule on the launch pad. I was 10 when you landed Armstrong and Aldrin on the moon. And I was 14 when you stopped going to the moon altogether. Over that time, I was excited for you and for America. But the vicarious thrill of the journey, so prevalent in the hearts and minds of others, was absent from my emotions. I was obviously too young to be an astronaut, but I also knew that my skin color was much too dark for you to picture me as part of that epic adventure. Not only that, even though you're a civilian agency, your most celebrated astronauts were military pilots at a time when war was becoming less and less popular. During the 1960s, the civil rights movement was more real to me than it surely was to you. In fact, it took a directive from Vice President Johnson in 1963 to force you to hire black engineers at your prestigious Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. I found the correspondence in your archives. Do you remember? James Webb, then head of NASA, wrote to German rocket pioneer Werner von Braun, who headed the center and was the chief engineer of the entire manned space program. The letter boldly and bluntly directs von Braun to address the lack of equal employment opportunities for Negroes and to collaborate with the area colleges, Alabama A&M and Tuskegee, to identify, train, and recruit qualified Negro engineers into the NASA Huntsville family. In 1964, you and I had not yet turned six when I saw picketers outside the newly built apartment complex of our choice in the Riverdale section of the Bronx. They were protesting to prevent Negro families, mine included, from moving there. I'm glad their efforts failed. These buildings were called, perhaps prophetically, the Skyview Apartments, on whose roof, 22 stories above the Bronx, I would later train my telescope on the universe. My father was active in the civil rights movement, working under New York City's Mayor Lindsay to create job opportunities for youth in the ghetto as the inner city was called back then. Year after year, the forces operating against this effort were huge. Poor schools, bad teachers, meager resources, abject racism, and assassinated leaders. So while you were celebrating your monthly advances in space exploration, from Mercury to Gemini to Apollo, I was watching America do all it could to marginalize who I was and what I wanted to become in life. I looked to you for guidance, for a vision statement that I could adopt that would fuel my ambitions, but you weren't there for me. Of course, I shouldn't blame you for society's woes. Your conduct was a symptom of America's habits, not a cause. I, I knew this. But you should nonetheless know that among my colleagues, I am the only one of my generation who became an astrophysicist in spite of your achievements in space, rather than because of them. For my inspiration, I instead turned to the libraries, remaindered books on the cosmos from bookstores, and my rooftop telescope, and the Hayden Planetarium. After some fits and starts through my years in school, where becoming an astrophysicist seemed at times to be the path of most resistance, I became a professional scientist. I became an astrophysicist. Over the decades that followed, you've come a long way, including most recently a presidentially initiated, congressionally endorsed vision statement that finally gets us back out of low Earth orbit. Whoever does not recognize the value of this adventure to our nation's future soon will, as the rest of the developed and developing world passes us by in every measure of technological and economic strength. Not only that, today, you look much more like America. From your senior level managers to your most decorated astronauts. Congratulations. You now belong to the entire citizenry. Examples of this abound, but I especially remember 
in 2004, when the public took ownership of the Hubble telescope, your most beloved unmanned mission. They all spoke loudly, ultimately reversing the threat that the telescope might not be serviced to extend its life another decade. Hubble's transcendent images of the cosmos had spoken to us all, as did the personal, the personal profiles of the space shuttle astronauts who deployed and serviced the telescope, and the scientists who benefited from its data stream. Not only that, I've even joined the ranks of your most trusted. I serve dutifully on your advisory council. I came to recognize that when you're at your best, nothing in this world can inspire the dreams of the nation the way you can. Dreams carried by a river of ambitious students eager to become scientists, engineers, and technologists in the service of the greatest quest there ever was. You have come to represent a fundamental part of America's identity, not only to itself, but to the world. So now that we both turned 49, and we're well into our 50th orbit around the sun. I want you to know that I feel your pains and share your joys. And I look forward to seeing you back on the moon. But don't stop there. Mars beckons, as do destinations beyond. Birthday, buddy. <laughs> Even if I have not always been, I am now your humble servant. Thank you. I'm sorry we ran a little long, I'm sorry, but I want to devote some time to your questions. We have a microphone right at the front of each aisle, and I welcome comments about anything or everything that's been bugging you or eating you or uh, critical or, or supportive. Yes, let's start here. Okay, you're talking about education will follow automatically once people get more involved in the space program for the engineering and science, but there seems to a movement in this country to suppress education. You've got state legislatures saying that education isn't a advantage, but some sort of po uh, program for welfare. And they're cutting back education aid, and at the same time, the universities are cutting engineering and science because they're more expensive. You've got a presidential, possible presidential candidate who says going to college is only for snobs, and the only thing you learn there is to be brainwashed by liberal professors in New Jersey is taking up teachers. I think we get the point. But, <laughs> but I just want to finish with New Jersey. But he's t cutting back education and using it, the money to give tax benefits to millionaires. What's going on and what can we do about this? And why is this happening? You think that people would be looking for the future, not trying to destroy it. That's why I try not to speak to politicians. <laughs> um, I, the question, you heard the question, what, what, there's a movement that's kind of anti-intellectual. Anti for the fate of a nation whose economic health and security depends on innovations that could derive from being educated. And so my sense of this is what we need to do is to compel the nation itself to want to become educated, to want to go into space, to recognize that there's economic value to that exercise. And once it becomes part of what we want for ourselves, it is then a fundamental part and dimension of who our elected officials are. We don't have to wait from one official to the next to see who has an education idea. It's our idea. I've been, I'll give you an example. I mean, uh, uh, I've been asked, oh, what would you do if you were head of NASA? 
I don't want to be head of NASA. You know why? Because the head of NASA reports to the president, and the president hands the head of NASA a budget, and that's what he's got to spend. I kind of like the fact that if I'm not in the command chain to the president, if I'm just a citizen, that means the president works for me. And under those conditions, you can motivate not me, me, and what works for all of us. <laughs> Under those conditions, you motivate the electorate to demand that which is in the best interest of this nation. And to the extent that we fail at that, our leaders will fail. It's that simple. Well, how do you get past this well-paid propaganda that's anti-education? You just can't get news coverage. I, I'm happy to say that there are four YouTube videos of me one of them that went viral in the last few days with two million views that is celebrating what it is to know about space. Uh, that, this is a measure of the, the appetite that people have for this adventure. And, and, and I tweet, right? I tweet kind of creepy, weird things sometimes, but I tweet, okay? And, and every tweet, it resonates with people, not every tweet, but many tweets resonate. They send it to their followers, so I have like, 360,000 Twitter followers. And, and, and if, if, if the, it's not just because I smile at them, it's because uh, there's something that they're, that they're eating that I'm feeding them, and I'm feeding them the universe. There's a cosmic appetite out there that remains to be fully served. And I'm just a piece of that puzzle. And there are others, among, uh, others of my ilk out there. There's Brian Cox. In, in the UK, he's more popular in the UK than Carl Sagan ever was here in America. There is, in fact, hope for this world. And it's represented by the electorate, not by our elected officials, in my humble opinion. Yes, sir. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Uh, the way I see it, you know, the, the, 20th, the 20th century uh, belonged to America and Russia as far as uh, space exploration is concerned. And now when I look at the International Space Station, I see that as one effort where there has been some collaboration at the international level. You talked a lot about war and economy uh, uh, being, being uh, motivations for countries uh, to do it alone. But what about cooperation um, globally, where China, India, Japan, Russia, America, we don't all go in separate directions, but come together to do something, you know, a grand vision, so to speak. And I say this despite being a, a, big, big, a very big uh, a, a skeptic of uh, UN and how the international system functions. But okay. is, there, is there some hope for us? A uh, couple of things. It? The International Space Station is the greatest collaboration of nations other than the, the waging of war in terms of the size, the scale, the investment, the number of nations that participate. So it is quite a model for the cooperation of space as we go forward. But I'm reminded of the scene in the film 2010, which ostensibly was the sequel to 2001, where there are Russians and Americans collaborating in space trying to find life on Jupiter, and, and, but this is still during the Cold War, and there's some Cold War incident at an embassy or at an at a, at a, at a ally country, and it gets really ugly, and nuclear weapons, you know, the silos are opened, all right? And it gets so bad, they have to empty each other's embassies from their respective countries. And up comes the phone call at Jupiter, and it said, you, uh, the Russians have to leave the American ship, and the Americans have to leave the Russian ship, because we're having these problems down here on Earth. That's just stupid, okay? So, so and you know that's how it would happen because there's politics driving all of this. So, so I'd like to believe that collaboration keeps nations at peace with each other, and since we're being economically driven in this idea, rather than militaristically driven, then everybody could have a piece of that pie. And, so, and it would stoke all the nations of the world, some of which are in desperate need of, in a greater need of an economic boost than even we are. So I agree, in the context of economic growth, it would be a boon, a boon to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Dr. Tyson. I have a real estate question. Real estate or realistic? Real estate. Real estate. Okay, uh, I'm a New York City resident, and so are you, right? Yes, I am. All right. 
So uh, as it pertains to... I have no idea where this question is going. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay. All right. Um, as it pertains to sea level rise, I feel more comfortable knowing that Neil deGrasse Tyson is a co-resident of New York City. <laughs> so that I can drown alongside you. That's what you... <laughs> So, uh, if I were looking to buy an apartment right now, would you advise against a ground level apartment? What, <laughs> what floor would you say I should be looking at for the, the minimum? Um, I would advise that you... <laughs> so, so, here's the problem. We now live in a culture... This is so not the 60s in this regard. We now live in a culture where a disaster is impending, and the first people think first thing people think of is, run, or buy up the toilet paper, <laughs> clear out the water from the shelves, the hurricane is coming, the tornado's coming, hide. If you're surrounded by scientists and engineers, that's not their first reaction. Their first reaction is, how can I stop this? How can I deflect it? How can I prevent this from ever happening again? So, what I'd like to see is an investment in, just pulling this out of it, geoengineering. How about that? You know where that would come? There's people among us who want to terraform Mars. That's a cool thought. Turn Mars into an oasis and we can all just live there. If you have the power to geoengineer Earth, you can control sea levels on Earth like, <laughs> like it's a trivial homework set, homework problem for school. So, I'm, I try not to run away from problems. I see them as interesting challenges to solve. And so why not view this as an occasion to solve the problem of the melting ice caps rather than to distract yourself with what apartment to buy, to avoid it? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, Dr. Tyson. Hello. Um, I just had a question. You cited economic incentives as one of the uh, main drivers of future exploration in space. Uh, I was just wondering if you could see uh, corporations being at the forefront of space exploration as opposed to the governments of the world. That will never happen, ever. <laughs> Another delusional point that I make in the book. There are all these people who say, let corporations do it. Even Newt Gingrich, while he's pandering, as politicians do regionally, to the space community of Florida, where you find Kennedy Space Center, he said, let's get corporations up there, and they, it, was, it was the rah-rah, all right? No, 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 anytime, this is important. You're all seated, you're seated, except the people lined up. <laughs> if something is expensive, which space exploration is, if something is dangerous, which space exploration is, if something has unmeasured risks, which space exploration is. It cannot be done by private enterprise because you cannot create a capital markets valuation of it. You can't, I'm just saying, you can, the way it works is I'm looking for investors. What's my return on my investment? Here's the risks, here's the cost, here's the rate of return. You cannot do that for something that expensive and that dangerous that you've never done before. You cannot get investors for that. You could never have gotten investors for that. Columbus was paid by governments. He drew the maps. He found out where the trade winds are. He found out where the hostile folks are, where he landed, and where the happy folks are. He found out where the wood supply was to fix his boats. Then he goes back, the maps are understood, then comes the Dutch East India Trading Company. The railroads across the country, somebody had to acquire that land. It was called the government. Somebody had to figure out where the good Indians were and the bad Indians were. Somebody had to figure out where the mountains and the valleys were. That was started with Thomas Jefferson and, and, and Lewis and Clark and other expeditions that went out there. You draw the maps, then private enterprise comes. So, what role would or could likely private enterprise play? Where the patents have already been granted and the risks are assessed and the dangers are understood, that would be low Earth orbit. NASA's been there, done that. 
It's still dangerous, but we understand the dangers. We can quantify them. Sure, let NASA pay a private enterprise to, to take us to the space station. I don't have a problem with that. Let private enterprise take tourists into orbit. I don't have a problem with that. Let, let it happen. We, 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 we live in a free market society. Free markets should go wherever an investment pays a return. And if that includes space, let it be so. But it, it, my read of the history of human conduct tells me it will never be the frontier of space. That will always need to be reserved for the wisdom of governments. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, uh, two part question based on my trip to Huntsville uh, almost 12 years ago with my son. Uh, one is the Saturn V was awesome, but the stuff they were talking about, maglev and where space travel could go and what they could do, that was really awesome. What happened to all that stuff that was sort of happening and sort of fell apart, part one? Part two, that son is I mean, why now, did we stop dreaming? Yeah. Yes, okay. Part two, the son, that son who will be 19 this month, who's getting your book, um, he wanted to work for NASA. He spent 10 years, math, physics, good at it, talented. You know what he wants to do now? Be a math teacher, which is not a bad thing. But we're losing our best and our brightest because all that drive is gone. And yeah, what, are we going to give up that whole generation? It's not good enough just to have a better science teacher in the classroom. Because when the science teacher is gone, because you move on to the next year, maybe a flame was lit, but something has to fan that flame. Some, occasionally you have to reignite it, as anyone who, but my, who, my, but who barbecues is, knows. But, but and so, when, so as you move forward, if there's a grand vision there, he becomes self-driven. But what do we do with this generation of kids who had that wind taken out of their sails, who a couple of years ago were still into it and then heard, no more space travel? The, the, do do I wouldn't say wind is out of the sails. The rocket fuel is out of their launch vehicle. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, it's a lost generation in that regard. That's the, that's the grim reality of it. Uh, there's no polite way to put it. So a lot of them, but they're very hireable. They just won't be working in the fields in which they were trained and specifically in those fields for which they had ambitions to work. That's, that's the lost generation of Americans in this, the 21st century. Have a nice day. <laughs> okay, so sorry. Yes. Yeah, hi, I, I just wanted to uh, expound on your death, war, wealth uh, e uh, hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's the WISE mission. It's the one where they map all the killer asteroids that are... Many missions have the capacity to map killer asteroids, and so WISE would be among them. Yes, okay. WISE is an acronym. Okay. And so then that actually, because of what you said, that might be a driver to have actually knock one out. Yeah, so it's a defense project at yes. that level. If you want to, you know, so while we are visiting the solar system, which now becomes our backyard, oh, there's an asteroid coming. Well, strap on this combination of rockets and take it out. I don't want the reason to fund the space program to be so that we can deflect an asteroid. But because why? once we inventory them all and we find out the next one that needs deflection is in 100 years, the funding goes away. But wouldn't that not create spin-offs? And also, what's the, what's the amount of unknowns? All of this co creates spin-offs. Uh, you get spin-offs. I'm not arguing the spin-offs. There are always spin-offs. But these are not the spin-offs I'm talking about. I'm talking about the effect on a culture where everybody wants to innovate whether or not they're in the space program. That's the real economic driver. But you don't... You and don't, so... You don't think saving the world is... is it will... It will quadruple NASA's funding. And then we get a better measurement of the asteroid and we find out it's not going to hit us and all the funding dries up just as it did after we landed on the moon. That is the wrong starter motivation to get a healthy space program. Okay, you don't think... It'll that. work, but it, it'll be a one-off. I don't well, want a one-off. But isn't that not a bridge too far? I mean, that's a way to gap. It is. The problem is our data on asteroids are on timescales longer than the re-election time of our representatives. <laughs> Eighty-eight percent of Congress runs for re-election every two years. Eighty-eight percent of senators and congressmen are on the block every two years. And I say there's an asteroid that's going to come in a hundred years. What, I, I'm, not, I'm not going there. It'll work when the time comes. Fine. 
But, but, you know, it might not work because if we don't do space between now and then, it might be too late to start a new space program to make that happen. And you know something? If we go extinct by an asteroid yet had a space program available to us to have deflected it, we would be the laughing stock of aliens in the galaxy. <laughs> what? They had opposable thumbs and they had a space program, yet they went extinct? Like the pea-brained dinosaurs before them? They had an excuse. They didn't have opposable thumbs. I, I would run in long. I would just take a few more questions, and then we'll... I don't know if we'll get to everybody on the line. Sir, love the hat, by the way. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my question is, it seems to me that competition is what kind of drove the, the space race. The competition between... United States or capitalism and competition between the Soviet Union and, and communism. That doesn't seem to be, the, it does not, doesn't seem to be a, a need for competitive, there is no competition now. Oh, okay, so today, so the question is back then we were in competition, for sure. Right. It was a military contest. Right now we have a kind of an economic competition going on with China. Um, and I wouldn't quite say there's a military conflict there, but I can tell you this. I've actually fantasized about this. Getting back to the military driver, I wanted to go visit the heads of state of China and whisper to them. I said, psst. I need you to leak a memo. It doesn't even have to be true. Just leak a memo that says, you want to put military bases on Mars, okay? All right. We'd be on Mars in two years. And you know how easy that would be in China? Because, like, Mars is already red, right? So you can market that. That would, that would, you got that one. So, so competition does sort of fuel fires, yes. And with regard to the collaboration on the space station, um, collaboration, I think, is better than not non-collaborating. But if you see any of those other countries as your economic competitor, it may be greater incentive for you to not join with them and try to beat them, all right? This is, uh, we sh it's, this is what humans do, all right? We can be in denial of it, but in fact, it's some of the greatest drivers there ever, ever was. So I try to be honest with ourselves about what it is to be human and what it is to get the job done. Yes, here's what I'll do. Um, let's, we'll end the line with who's standing now, and I, I'm gonna give you sound bite answers. I'm gonna pretend I'm on Jon Stewart, okay? And that way we'll get through you quickly and then we'll call it a night, okay? Rather than whole fleshed out answers, go. I was just actually given a, a short clip answer by Jon Stewart a couple days ago, so I'm pretty used to it. My question is, granted you, are, um, you gather enough collective will of the people to give the motivation, um, economic driver, to actually make this happen and get the budget going, something longer than the particular term of Congress or a president, what is the next step you mentioned that instead of focusing on one-offs, uh, particular destination, or killing uh, asteroids, um, to create a platform in which we can do anything that we, we dream of at that time, what is your idea or what would your proposal be for that platform? Is it a launch loop, a space elevator, maglev? As no, I don't, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna prescribe the next steps that people take. That'll be a function of the creativity of the engineers and technologists of the day. Maybe they want to build a space elevator, all right? That's, uh, that's a cheap way to get to the geosynchronous orbit. Uh, by the way, as you visit our space exhibit here, we, there's a whole section on the space elevator. It's Beyond Earth is the name of the exhibit, um, uh, uh, curated by my colleague, Mike Shara. So, uh, so you build a capacity to go anywhere and let Scientists decide, oh, I need to go here and there. And geopolitics says, we've got to do this. The military says, we've got to put a, a laser beam over here. And, and the, the tourist folks said, I want to visit there. It'll just run its course. As long as you're advancing a frontier, our economy gets stoked, and I don't care what the destination is. So you is. don't have a particular preference about which? I have no preference. Okay. Thank All you. of space <laughs> is my preference. <laughs> Thank you, okay. Dr. Tyson. <laughs> yes. Hey, I wanted to ask about um, a colonizing the moon. Now, I really don't think I could ever vote for New Green Gingrich, but, um, but let's just say... Remember, you're in New York City Obama, speaking now. Yes. Let's say Obama was like, let's do it. We're going to the moon. What are the actual realities of a moon colony, and like, what would that entail? 
And could we do that? I think a moon colony is a little bit ambitious because like there's no air on the moon and there's no yeah. cattle, you know, there's no grass. So uh, it's a little ambitious, I think. Is it crazy? No, it's not crazy. It's not, it's not more crazy than Queen Isabella saying, here Columbus, go find the edge of the earth. Uh, it's not more crazy than that. Not having an atmosphere. Yeah, that, that's, been there that's a years. sticking point right there. Um, yeah. <laughs> Because wherever Columbus went, he could still breathe, you know? So, <laughs> um, so these are challenges, and maybe a moon colony won't pan out because you can't get enough interest in it. But there will always be science you can do on the moon, and the military today views the moon as a strategic place. Cislunar space is the new word, may be new to you tonight, is the new high ground, which is the entire space between Earth and the moon's orbit. So there could be military reasons for doing that as well. And I don't, you know, I don't like war, but I recognize that war is not a new th conduct among nations and among people. And so, uh, and just because, you know, the people say, oh, let's make space, you know, no war in space. <laughs> if you're that committed, why are we having wars down here? I mean, why, what, what are you saying? If, if, if you can manage to not have war in space, why not manage that down here? And we fail at that badly. So I'm given no reason, I'm not, I'm not even hopeful to think that there won't be space wars. I, I wish I could be hopeful. I don't have that much confidence in human conduct. So, so maybe the colonies won't pan out, but there'll be plenty of stuff to do in space, I promise. Maybe the colony is just a place to go, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a one-week Tor torture. That's what I want to do. I just we'll want you. to go. Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi. Where does SpaceX fit in all this? Is it SpaceX is, a, they're trying to make a vehicle with the efficiency of private enterprise that will substitute for NASA's vehicles to go back and forth to low Earth orbit. Now, are they going to substitute for the money that would have gone to NASA? Or are they going to enhance NASA? No, so what happens is NASA gets a budget, and instead of having to spend more to send their own people, They'll just do it with private enterprise. The same way the Postal Service rents belly space on airplanes to move your mail. So it's a good thing. It's, we presume that when you go private enterprise, they'll do it more efficiently and more intelligently, uh, more reliably than what a government program would have done. So that's the goal. Okay. And that's SpaceX, founded by Elon Musk, the writer of PayPal, sold it to who? Uh, uh, eBay for a billion dollars. And he was like 32 or something. I mean, yeah. One of these space billionaires who decide, who loves space so much, he's trying to now make his own spacecraft. Yes. Hey, wait, how old are you? Eight. You're eight. That is so cool. <laughs> now, is this past your bedtime? It's so past my bedtime. I don't know what to tell you here. Uh, so go on. Uh, I want to go to, to Mars. I was wondering. <laughs> Let the record show our eight year old wants to go to Mars and no one else has yet to ask that of themselves. Yes, go ahead. And I was wondering what it would take to get there. Well, you are the age right now of who we would now. So, in other words, when we go to Mars, which I would like to think is in the next couple of decades, you will then become the age of those astronauts. So you're the, I'm too old, I'll be maybe dead by then. But you, <laughs> you'll be just right. And so the, the, the urge to want to go to Mars is just right for an eight-year-old. Okay, so uh, it's dangerous. You'll be a long time away from home. So uh, probably, you know, want to get, you know, take some videos with you, you know, and some books. And um, NASA try, goes, puts a lot of effort into making the space journey very much feel at home. So you get to still have an email account and you, and you get to make phone calls, with, uh, video calls with your friends. And plus NASA is talking to you all the time, right? And so it's a long voyage and there's still some challenges. There's radiation from the sun. We don't yet know how to shield you from it. And so, but I, I see those as engineering problems, not physics problems. And we have very, a lot of clever engineers out there. And it's, it's nine months to Mars. Then you have to wait until Earth and Mars line back up in their orbits to come back. So that's a couple of years. So the whole round trip is about three or four years. You'll be three or four years away from home. So as long as you could, you're okay with that, we'll send you to Mars. <laughs> you sign up.
Thank you. Yeah. Well, she gives me hope, but my question for you, Dr. Tyson, is how can we get our sons and daughters who are so wrapped up in the fruits of technology that they do nothing else? They don't innovate, they don't create, they don't have a passion, they just stay on Facebook and ask for another telephone. <laughs> uh, so, so the problem is not that they are looking down in their technology. The problem is that we are not engaged in a project that is grand enough to compel them to look up. That is the challenge. Okay. Uh, can I give you an example? It's a quick, I said I'd be quick on these, but I'm not being quick. Uh, do you know what tweet ups are? So in, in the Twitterverse, uh, companies or agencies, NASA did a few of these, where there's a launch and you invite a certain number of people who are active on Twitter and you give lectures to them and they're tweeting everything and so the, the Twitterverse learns about what's going on vicariously. Mm -hmm. I, at one of the NASA launches, gave a talk to the TweetUp community. Mm -hmm. and you know what I said to myself? I said, this is the biggest test of my life. I want to be so compelling in my delivery to this audience that they will not even want to tweet <laughs> because it will distract them from what I'm saying on this stage. <laughs> and so I started speaking. And I reserve my best stuff. It's, it's flowing. It's going. And nobody's looking down at their device. Because what was coming out from up here was a greater message than anything they could have possibly been doing on their smartphone. So don't blame the technology. Blame the absence of vision. Okay. Yes. Hi, I have a philosophical question. Okay. Would you rather die now or live forever? <laughs> <laughs> um, I kind of, you know, bought into the, the, the concept of a natural life. I mean, I, so, so, so I know philosophers like having those kind of debates, uh, but I, don't, I never believe that the options available to a creative person are ever limited by the choices offered by a philosopher. <laughs> so for example, if there's the lifeboat and there's only a certain amount of food for four, but there are six people, so do you throw them overboard, otherwise everyone dies? Would you eat them? Like, so these choices, and I'm saying, maybe we can invent a way to draw fish from the ocean so that we don't have to throw them overboard. See, I, I like solutions to problems rather than the blunt do A or B, all right? And part of this, I think, is because we grew up in a multiple choice school system. <laughs> Sometimes answers exist where beyond the choices that you have thought up as the person who wrote the exam. So that is my perhaps unfulfilling answer to you. Uh, okay, yes. Indeed, and that's why we don't have a hashtag posted for tonight's event, so we don't get distracted by twittering <laughs> about it. The uh, early observation about the politicians talking about a, uh, not, la a need to be anti-science and anti-education is very entertaining, particularly since they're doing it in front of video cameras with smartphones, which wouldn't exist had they had their way. Yeah, this is part of the hypocrisy of it all especially the people who say, I don't need the space program. You know, I don't need that to know. I've got my GPS and my weather channel, so what do I need to spend money on space for? <laughs> this, you get a lot of this going on. Yes, sir. Okay, Dr. Tyson, the uh, big expense of space, I believe, is getting off the surface of the Earth. It's the rockets, the big rockets, which is really World War II technology. Has they been looking seriously at anti-gravity just like in the early H.G. Wells, what's it, Earth, man, Earth to the Moon or whatever From it was Earth called. to the Moon, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, a uh, good question. Among the propulsion research that's going on, it does not include anti-gravity. Uh, anti-gravity is a pretty remote notion with respect to the laws of physics. And so, you don't find people who are, ready, who are physics fluent to, ready to devote their lives on anti-gravity. The people who tend to do anti-gravity are people who think that laws of physics are only guidelines rather than <laughs> laws. 
And so these are the, the same community who would do, for example, perpetual motion machines. It violates known and tested laws of physics. So, okay, maybe you'll succeed, but I am so confident you won't that I'm, not, I'm just gonna go about my way. So, so don't expect a lot of money to be devoted to anti-gravity devices. But <laughs> nonetheless, there are other challenges of propulsion. There's, you know, uh, there's, there's the ion drives and things, and we are way behind. You're absolutely right. It is World War II propulsion technology, and we are so far behind that it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. I tweeted recently, I said, um, what did I say? I said, uh, the state of the country now is that I'd be embarrassed if an alien landed. I'd just be embarrassed to show them what our technology is. <laughs> you know, you want to sort of, you know, do a one-upsmanship on the alien. And I just like, no, I got nothing for you, alien. I'm sorry. <laughs> go, go find some other planet to show your stuff. Hello, yes. Hello, thank you. A um, couple of comments, then a question. But you got to make them quick because we're, we're running Index. long. Index. Thank you for fun index. A tweet, a long list of favorites already. Would a NASA reality show, Luna Shore, be more popular than Jersey Shore? Civilization's future depends on the answer. <laughs> okay. But well, I, I have to I, I, say I, that louder near the... Okay, so, so uh, thank you for this. She's like my PR agent here. She's saying thank you for the index, that it's very rich and, and fleshed out. Also, since I've tweeted on the universe often and on space, I've tossed in many of those tweets through the book. They're kind of like uh, biscuits. If you've earned your way to that point, I'll hand you a tweet. And this one tweet, if you could read it closer to the microphone, because it... Would a NASA reality show Lunar Shore be more popular than Jersey Shore? Civilization's future depends on that answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you for that. So, so yeah, a lot of uh, effort went into this, and the organization of this effort was made possible, there's, there's an editor's name on the cover of this book, edited by Avis Lang, who's my longtime editor from Natural History Magazine. And that this, this is every thought I've ever had about our past, present, and future in space. And to coordinate those thoughts into something coherent requires an editor. So I just wanna publicly thank Avis Lang for that. But did you have a question? I love the sentence, the business of saving the planet requires commitment. My question is, we're all asking you questions. Do you have a question to bounce back at us to take with us when we leave for further thought? I have, yes, my question to, for you to take back with you would be, why aren't you spending more energy trying to convince others of the value of this epic adventure? And that you can do that by letters to the editor, op-eds, any of the above. If you have an opinion, you share it. So thank you, thank you for that. So we'll go real quick, we have six left and we're done, yes. Hi there. So um, let's say that I came here tonight and uh, this, I was kind of new to this whole space thing and, uh, and I wanted to learn more. Is there some kind of podcast, maybe somebody with you had some comedians in there on a Sunday, uh, I can check this thing out and, and perhaps engage further in this conversation and maybe learn a couple things. Oh, so you want to learn more about space? So, something that I could uh, perhaps tweet out to my friends. Say, hey, go check out this. <laughs> okay, not everyone is a reader out there, I understand. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to hit every angle here. So I've, I tweet, right? And I'm also host of a radio Star show radio. called Star Talk Radio, where we, it's a little irreverent. You know, I have a comedian as my co-host and my guests are not scientists. They're people hewn from pop culture. And we explore ways that science influences their lives. And I recommend you check it out. We've, I've had Morgan Freeman as a guest, and Whoopi Goldberg, and Jon Stewart, and, and uh, Joan Rivers. Uh, I, can I tell you, I said to Joan, Joan, I said, so Joan, what do you do if, if the aliens come? So she said, I, I don't care if they come, just as long as they're single and Jewish. <laughs> so it's a celebration of science, and I'm just trying to get it out there so people uh, are not don't fear it. So, but yes, in modern times, it takes many media to be fluent because not everyone is doing the same thing at the same time as we were in the 1960s, all watching Walter Cronkite tell us what the day's news was. And so to clarify, I would, I would check out Star Talk Radio. StarTalkRadio.net is the thing. Thank you for the... <laughs> yes, sir. 
I will try and make this introduction as brief as I possibly can. I am one of the lost generation you just spoke about. I am 32, I will be 33 this fall. I live next to Vandenberg Air Force Base and I went out myself with my father, the editor-in-chief of the local newspaper and watched the missiles go up until Challenger happened and the shuttle happening in my town was canceled. I have an eight-year-old daughter who sings along with Symphony of Science, both with your voice and with others talking about. Thank you. <laughs> Symphony of Science, a series of creative YouTube videos where it takes publicly available clips and like puts it into a beat. It's very creative and they've have, they're hugely popular. Thanks. She sings along, among other things, most her favorite is A Case for Mars and she talks about going to Mars herself. I want to say thank you to the other little girl who is exactly my daughter's age. Okay. Um, coming back from that, there is a deep understanding on my part as a physics major and a physics educator of our connection to the universe and as much as I want to believe in life elsewhere, as a scientist I want to see it. And until we as sentients have seen that somewhere else, I feel like it is part of that defense motivation that you think of and mention for us to get off planet. I don't care if it's an asteroid. I don't care if it's the sun going red giant in five billion years. If we stay here, we're doomed. And as far as we know, we're it. All right, so this is a point that is, was made by Stephen Hawking, where he said we have to be a multi-planet species, otherwise we're doomed because something bad could happen to Earth, a virus, an asteroid, or what have you. Here's my rebuttal to that, if I may. May I finish the question? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel that a motivation like that is valuable as a component? The economics are part of feeding the species, part of feeding our country, part of feeding ourselves. Uh, I don't think it is a good enough driver because I don't believe it. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Yes, please. And uh, Hawking made this point. We've got to be a multi-planet species. Otherwise, all the eggs in one basket, you go extinct. All right. What might be that which threatens Earth? Is it an asteroid, a killer asteroid the size of Mount Everest, the one that rendered 70% of all species extinct 65 million years ago? Hit the Yucatan Peninsula of, of Mexico? It wasn't Mexico back then, by the way. I don't know what, <laughs> whatever the dinosaurs called it is what it was. Um, <laughs> so here's the, here's the thing. If we're gonna be a multi-planet species, and I hinted to this before, we'd have to terraform some other planet. It would have to be Mars, because no one knows what to do with the runaway greenhouse of Venus. Terraform Mars. If we have the power to terraform Mars and the technology to ship a billion people there, we can deflect the asteroid. <laughs> I mean, I mean to th the scale of that operation, relative to whatever it would take to protect us, I think there's no contest. You deflect the asteroid, you find the cure for the virus, you stop the volcano, you, you, you realign the plates of the Earth. I, I, I don't see that as a realistic solution to an impending problem that we might face. What I do see as the solution is the solution to that problem, rather than running away to another planet so that Earth can become toast. And then you have two planets and the asteroid's headed to one of them. What do you do with everybody on that planet? Sorry, we're the safe ones. Goodbye. It's not a practical... <laughs> if you have the power of geoengineering on that scale, you don't need to leave Earth. You, fit, you make Earth exactly as you want it to be. If you had the power enough to fix Mars, you, you can fix Earth in any way you choose. If you this the, is my contention. If you have the power enough to fix Mars, don't you have power enough to get somewhere outside the solar system? Possibly, yeah, so we'll go there too. <laughs> but the motivation wouldn't be so that we won't die on Earth. It, I, I just don't see that. Okay. I, I'm not convinced by the arguments. Real quick, yes. Okay, so um, you started out with kind of the three motivators and one of them dropped out really quick. Um, but isn't the whole kind of glor glorification of kings and whatnot, isn't that really just 
fear of death and sort of wanting to have your name in the history books alongside Buzz Aldrin, so long as there are history books, isn't that still with us? It could be with the individual, but you don't, you don't, not big enough. you don't control that much money. It's not big enough for, for humanity. Right. I'm talking about large scale projects that divert a major fraction of your gross national product, gross domestic product in human capital or financial capital. And just because you want a tombstone, that's, that doesn't, the cost doesn't, uh, your tombstone and a pyramid are not the same thing. <laughs> so, so the pyramid, yeah, they want to live forever, but they had the power to do it. And it's an expensive tombstone and people did it in the service of the Pharaoh. He has the power. The people who built the pyramid didn't. So it's a power thing. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fear factor as well. So. We're all too small. To we're too small as individuals, unless you were king. In fact, our version of a king to do this would be Bill Gates. Say, Bill, Get the take Bill us to Mars. <laughs> he would then it'd be like a vanity project and he'd be like our king and he'd be spending the crown jewels to do this. <laughs> uh, I, I'll talk to him. I'll call him up and we'll find out. Okay. Yes. Um, I have two questions. Sure. Uh, did you celebrate Pi Day yesterday? I did celebrate Pi Day yesterday. <laughs> For those of you who aren't geek enough to know what that sentence just meant, uh, on March 14th, if you write it out in American style, it'd be 3 slash 14, 3.14, and it's Pi. And so the Pi geeks out there celebrate it. And so it's a really geeky thing to do. And I tweeted, th there was pressure for me to tweet something on Pi Day. So I, I tweeted it and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not out of control. I, I got Pi to 12 decimal places. And that's good, enough to, that's good enough to get the circumference of the Earth to a thousandth of an inch. So that's good enough for me. But yes, I did celebrate Pi Day. But yeah. um, And my second question is, what's your favorite, like, three numbers in pi. My favorite three digits in pi. Uh, I like the first three because that gets you most of the way there, okay? Okay, thank you. Yes? Uh, you referred to uh, engineers and biologists as being important for our future. Uh, how is the historian important for our future? How is the historian important? Everything I know about human conduct that we need to put into play going forward comes to me from an analysis of history. So uh, if you don't know the conduct of humans and what motivates them and, what, and, and the relationships between nations, just, just you know, go back home. You're not useful out there if you want to bring real solutions to real problems. So uh, historians are really important in this. Uh, particularly historians who put things in context, rather than, which is what they, most of them do, rather than just retell a timeline of events. Context matters. Attitudes matters. Cultures matter. And so, yeah, I don't want to know just what, for, what war you fought and what king replaced whom. I want to know what was in the hearts and minds of the people who were in that country, the attitudes they had. What led one country to war against another for a thousand years? What led one country to not have wars? What's going on in their culture, in their minds? So, by all means, want to major in history? Go for it. Thank you. Yeah, it's just be harder to find a job, but other than that, <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. So, the last two questions. Yes. So these better be awesome questions. The pressure is on. Okay. Yes. So I just have a quick question and a quick comment. My question is: You often talk about the whole government factor of the government has to do it first and then private enterprise can... Not because I want it to be that way. That's just my read of history. Exactly. Yes. But do you believe in that to get further than the edges of the solar system, we need to unify as like one government, one people as humanity to get out there? No. You need another law of physics. <laughs> 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 the problem is harder than just whether you combine governments. If you want to leave the solar system and visit the nearest star and do it on the fastest spaceship we ever launched and you hitch a ride on that craft, 
you would arrive at the nearest star to the sun 50,000 years later. So you need to be really fertile <laughs> or we need some other way to some other understanding of the fabric of space-time because travel on those time scales are incommensurate with the longevity of the human species of, of the of the human individual so to the moon is a few days mars is a few years that fits within our 80 year time uh, life expectancy traveling to the other stars does not so for the moment i'm good with the telescope to get me there and there are plenty of destinations including a whole new swath of dwarf planets Pluto included, get over it, um, <laughs> to visit. No, nobody says you have to visit a traditional planet. There are many of rocky surfaces that would welcome our footprints. And I, I just have a quick comment. I read this Calvin and Hobbes strip once, and it said the, the, the way right now that we know that there is intelligent life out there is that it hasn't tried to contact us yet. Yeah. <laughs> and I got to say, I'd, I'm completely, I completely agree with that. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've, said, I've said that same thing, but in a more severe way. Uh, what I've, there, uh, I've said, uh, aliens have actually visited us, okay? Well, there are two branches of that comment. One of them, they've actually visited us, but they landed in like Times Square and no one noticed, okay? So, <laughs> or in Hollywood, right, and no one noticed. Uh, but another one, a, a more terrifying prospect, is that they have visited us, they have inspected who and what we are, and have concluded that there's no sign of intelligent life on Earth. <laughs> yes, now I have to ask how old you are. Eleven. You're eleven, okay, welcome. Is it past your bedtime? No. No, okay, <laughs> good. You have a question? Yes. Um, your tweets in your book, are they just random? Are they for fun? Because like, um, in chapter four, you're talking about aliens. You say any suspicious that they will be evil is more of a reflection of our fear about how we would treat an alien species if we found them than any actual knowledge about how an alien species would treat us. And then you go to sp space tweet seven. How do shield sneezes in space, you ask? Helmet blocks all 40,000 spewed mu mucus droplets. So aliens are safe. And then, we're listening for them right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I warned you about my tweets, didn't I? Uh, yeah, I forgot why I talked about sneezing inside of a space helmet, because that's a really kind of nasty thing to think about. Um, you don't want to have a head cold while you're spacewalking. Um, yeah, the tweets, they're just random thoughts that come to me. I don't invent them for the tweet. I have them anyway. And then I... <laughs> make them a tweet and share these random... Another one I had was, uh, if human... If, if, if our blood were based not on iron, turning it red, but instead on copper, turning it green, then what color would the stoplights be? <laughs> I'm just saying. There was a thought I had, and so I, so I tweeted it. And the people tweeting back said, mind blown, I can't figure it out, oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, I had, I had one other one, just some weird stuff happened. this is the last thing. So there's a, there's a URL shortener called bit.ly, it's a URL shortener. And so you have a big fat URL, you put it in there, it gives you a short one so it's easy to email. So I decided to just test it and I took uh, bit.ly which is the name of the website, put that into the URL shortener and it got longer, right? So, so I tweeted, I had to tweet that, right? The URL shortener made its own URL longer. And that has nothing to do with astrophysics. Here's one for you, this one will keep you awake at night. You ready? If Pinocchio declared, my nose is about to grow, what would his nose actually do? <laughs> because if it began to grow, it meant he was telling the truth and it shouldn't have grown. If it doesn't grow, it meant he was lying and then it should have grown. I tweeted that one time. People said, mind blown. <laughs> Thank you all for coming tonight. <laughs>